you, everybody. So my name is Akiva Leesman. I'm the CEO of Sailfish Royalty Corp. For those of you with really good eyesight, I have a badge that says I'm CEO of Mako Mining Corp as well, which is true, I'm speaking later, so everybody's welcome to, to take a look at that as well. Uh, the history behind Sailfish is that this was a spin-out of a predecessor of, of Mako, and one of the, the core royalty assets that Sailfish owns is on a, a mine that, uh, that Mako is developing uh, today. Uh, in fact, we're going to be in commercial production of the San Albino project uh, in late summer of next year. Now, for those that don't know my background, in addition to being CEO of an operating gold mining company and CEO of a royalty company, I also work for a large private equity firm called Wexford Capital. And Wexford is also in the royalty business. Uh, they're also in the operating business, uh, principally on the energy side of the equation. So a little bit of a history of, of Wexford on the royalty space. In 2007, uh, Wexford started a, uh, an oil E&P company called Diamondback uh, Energy. Uh, we went public with that in 2012. In 2013, we acquired some royalty interests on ground that Diamondback owned and operated. That royalty company right now spins off $280 million a year in royalty revenues. It's a $5 billion market cap royalty vehicle. And Diamondback Energy is now an $18 billion market cap E&P company. So Wexford does have a long-standing history in creating royalty companies. And what we wanted to do in the gold mining space is very similar to what we did with Diamondback and Viper. So we create an operating company, have an affiliated and associated royalty company, and use the operating team and the synergies between the two companies to grow the business. Now, a lot has happened uh, in the life cycle of Sailfish since it went public uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, principally, we finally uh, got the go-ahead, permits and the capital, to start building the San Albino deposit, which is the first large royalty that we have within the Mako platform. We have a 3% effective net smelter return royalty on the ground that's being developed right now over at Mako and a 2% royalty on the other 140 square kilometers, which I'll get, which I'll get into in a second. Um, additionally, we have a royalty on El Dorado Gold's Tokenshin Zinio mine, uh, which is currently uh, in a re-evaluation mode within El Dorado. Hopefully by the end of this year they'll have an updated uh, pre-feasibility on it, but it's permitted shovel-ready, a 2 million ounce reserve. Uh, expectations are that it will be producing uh, nearly 200,000 ounces a year when it turns on, and effectively we have a 1.5% uh, NSR royalty on that as well. And then finally, about a month ago, uh, we completed the acquisition of another publicly traded company called Toraco Gold. Now Toraco's main asset was a series of royalties that they had on a world scale, Nevada based gold mining, open pit gold mining project uh, that's currently under development by a Canadian private equity fund called Waterton. Uh, that's the Spring Valley mine. Now the history behind this, uh, this royalty, and I'll, I'll go over in, in, a, in a bit, is that there's a 7% royalty on this mine that was expected to be producing over 250,000 ounces a year when it turns on. Now, once we launched the acquisition of Taraco, we were able to acquire 3% of that royalty, and Waterton managed to acquire 1% of that royalty elsewhere. So right now, there are, uh, I believe, three different owners of the royalty. We own 3%. Uh, a company you may be aware of, Cisco Royalties, owns a half percent. And then Red Kite, who ironically I used to work for about nine years ago, owns about 2.5% of this 6% royalty right now. And finally, we have a, a royalty on a small-scale mine that's being operated by uh, Endeavor Silver called El Compas, which gives us about $250,000 a year in royalty revenues, which is about what our GNA is. So uh, I don't draw a salary from Sailfish. I have uh, options in this. Uh, my colleague Cesar Gonzalez, who helps on the corporate development side over here, doesn't draw a salary. We do get paid on, on Mako because we, we do have mortgages to, to, to pay for. But, uh, but over here, our entire compensation is through, uh, through the, the appreciation of the equity. Now, when we set out to form uh, Sailfish, uh, our objective was very simple. is that we wanted to grow the royalty business to the point where it was scalable enough for a larger royalty company 
to take a serious look at eventually acquiring the asset. Uh, we were spitballing as to how big the royalty company needed to, to be, and then when we started Sailfish in 2014 and 2015, really we had a back of the envelope calculation that if we have visibility of getting to somewhere between 15 or 25 million dollars a year in, in cash flow, we would be of interest to, to just about any royalty company uh, on the planet. So the, the good news about the Taracco asset, and, and granted actually all three of the, the royalties, the, the material royalties within the portfolio are, are not in production right now, but there is visibility of getting to that level. So between San Albino turning on, San Albino on that 3% royalty will deliver to Sailfish starting next year in excess of US $2 million per year, really for as far as the eye can see as we, as we see it. Uh, Token Tanzino would add another $3 million a year in revenue to Sailfish. And then if and when the Spring Valley asset turns on, that 3% royalty on a 250 plus thousand ounce a year recoverable gold producer, um, you can do the math at $1,500 gold, it looks like we are now in the range to be of interest to some of the larger royalty companies. And you can see from this graph over here that once you get to that size and scale, your valuation will increase. So my objective was to get this business to a material level, and now my objective is to one form or another get this valuation up to some of our peers, either through presenting at wonderful conferences such as this, or through M&A. All right, so the history of San Albino. This was a very, for those that uh, are unfamiliar with how Mako Mining was developed, and Mako is the owner of San Albino, this was a long, winding history on how Sailfish actually wound up in this location. In 2014, Sailfish entered into a streaming agreement with the predecessor of Mako, Golden Rain Resources, to have a encumbrance on their property, which for all intents and purposes made it unfinanceable um, to, to develop. Right? So there was a 40% gold stream at $700 an ounce on a small part of the property. For about four and a half years, the predecessor of Mako was trying to merge with Golden Rain. And to their credit, they finally came to that, uh, that positive uh, conclusion uh, in late last year where we, uh, where we uh, achieved our merger of the two companies uh, forming Mako Mining. Now, what, as part of that merger, um, Sailfish agreed to restructure the royalty from a gross encumbrance of 40% on the gold mining asset to a 3% top line royalty on the area that's being developed right now over at San Albino and for the first time ever to have a 2% royalty on the other 137 square kilometers of highly prospective ground um, that uh, San Albino currently contains. And you can see in Mako's press releases, we've had not only great infill results like we put out this morning where we hit over 50 gram a ton material, over five meters true width, all within an open pit mine plan. But we've also made material discoveries elsewhere on the property where the first time in Sailfish's existence, it actually has a royalty encumbrance over that area. Excuse me, Kiva, just so you know, uh, I'm guess have the Mako presentation, so if you want to speak to it, you can... Sure. Uh, well, well, we'll keep it. We'll keep it to Sailfish right now, and then we'll, we'll go to, to, to Mako again. Check your calendars on, on when I speak on, on behalf of, uh, of Mako. The um, so now that we actually have a, a royalty that's going to be turning on uh, in the late summer of next year, this will be the the cornerstone of our cash flow for the foreseeable future. So we have a small royalty over at El Campos, but uh, but principally speaking, the, the San Albino stream when it turns on in the late summer uh, will will spearhead our uh, our royalty business. Additionally, as part of the merger and the renegotiation of the stream, Sailfish got some other stuff uh, as part of the merger. Um, the predecessor of Mako had what we think is a world-scale exploration asset called Gavilanis. Uh, Gavilanis is a 35 million ounce uh, silver resource. It's just up the road from First Majestic's San Dimas mine. We do think it has potential to be hundreds of millions of ounces if an appropriate amount of exploration capital is put into it. At some point in the near future, Gavilanis will be monetized, spun off or sold. Additionally, Taraco had an exploration asset, a one million ounce near surface deposit in Idaho called Almaden Nutmeg that we aim to monetize or spin off and hopefully we'll be able to do that in this calendar year. 
So in addition to the valuation coming from the near-term cash flow from San Albino, we also have some very valuable exploration assets that form the basis of our, uh, of our market capitalization. And then the, the big boys, which is the token Genzino royalty, a 1.5% royalty on a 2.5% uh, uh, on a, a 2 million ounce reserve uh, that Eldorado is, uh, is developing right now, and then uh, eventually the Spring Valley royalty. So a little bit about, uh, about San Albino. We sit right now on 140 square kilometers of ground. There's a 23 kilometer strike length over here where the entire belt is mineralized. Whether there's going to be additional economic deposits elsewhere on this area, uh, we don't know. Uh, that will require some additional drilling. But that San Albino area, there was a 2015 resource estimate of about a million ounces at eight gram material. Uh, we're in the process of developing an open pit mine in and around San Albino, uh, where we'll be producing somewhere between 45 and 50,000 ounces a year to start, with the objective of increasing production by 2022 to 1,000 tons a day. And if the grades hold up to where we think they're going to hold up, that would equate to about 100,000 ounces a year. So you can do the math. We'll have a hybrid royalty of 3% in the square around San Albino and a 2% royalty elsewhere. So that will be at least US $2 million to start going up to about US $3.5 million a year shortly thereafter. In terms of our capital structure, we currently have 58.9 million shares uh, outstanding. Um, the only debt that we took on was a $12 million uh, friendly unsecured loan from Wexford Capital that was there to repay debt that Waterton, the private equity fund that's developing Spring Valley, had on Taraco. So what kept away some of the larger royalty players from acquiring Taraco was that debt and what Waterton's intent with the project and with Taraco were. Uh, we were actually one of the few royalty companies that had the financial capacity uh, to deal with, uh, with Waterton. It kept quite a few junior royalty companies away from the acquisition process when that merger uh, was facilitated over the last couple of months. Five and a half million options. Uh, most of that is to myself and my colleague, uh, Cesar Gonzalez, and no warrants at the company. We do royalties because royalties work. Uh, we are investors. That is our, our thesis, and, our, and we've not only done this in gold, but we've done this in other commodities. Um, royalty business is a relatively low risk way of making money in the mining space, and at the end of the day, that's what we care about. It's nice to develop projects, and it's nice to pour big shiny objects, but the reality is well, we're in this business to see our stocks go up. So a little bit about the, uh, the other royalties within the, the portfolio right now. Um, between San Albino, Token Zinzino, and Spring Valley, we think we have a royalty portfolio that will get us into that magical range of between US 15 and $25 million a year of cash flow. In jurisdictions that, that people are, are very kind to, so, so Nevada, uh, Brazil, and the burgeoning mining jurisdiction over at, uh, in Nicaragua right now. And this really will form the basis of us re-rating in terms of our valuation with respect to Sailfish. And if we can't do that through the public markets, we have no issues of selling ourselves to a larger royalty company uh, to complete our, uh, our successful exit of this investment. So in terms of where we are on the, the project development schedule, it is, it is very important in terms of having a financial backer at MAKO uh, to go and advance that, uh, that project. So normally when a royalty company of our size has royalty interests on, uh, on assets that are sponsored by junior mining companies without access to capital, there's a very real chance that the projects will never get developed. The fact that Mako does have the capital, it's building the mine right now, it's turning on, it's going to be, if not uh, the highest grade open pit only mines in the world, one of them. And uh, we're 20% done building the mine, and very quickly we're going to be going from this relatively high risk curve when we have these splashy exploration assets to one where we're in development and by the end of next year being in real cash flow once San Albino turns on. And with that, I'll open up the floor to any questions. Any questions here? Yes, sir. Sure, so uh, Waterton has been uh, intentionally quiet. Uh, so the, the last time that there was any uh, public update, it was actually through Terraco itself, where, uh, being a little bit facetious, they were kind of peeking over the fence to see what, uh, what Waterton was drilling at and, and put out a press release to, to, to show that there was some, some significant uh, updates going on there. Uh, from our estimation, um, they're focused on 
uh, trying to have the smoothest, a streamlined path towards permitting on the asset that they can get. Uh, so in our understanding, um, they are in active discussions uh, with the local and federal government uh, to do appropriate uh, land swaps to, to streamline the, the permitting process to avoid going through uh, a major uh, NEPA process within the United States. Um, they have been spending a lot of money on drilling. Uh, when this was owned by, uh, by Barrick and a junior partner, Midway Gold, um, there was at one point a resource in excess of 5 million ounces, uh, open pit, potentially heat bleach mine uh, in Nevada. Those things are, uh, are rare. Now, with respect to, to Waterton, the, they had a, a $12 million US loan uh, to Taraco, and then that loan uh, did have a buyback option where they were able to repurchase 45% of an underlying subsidiary that held the royalty interest within, uh, within uh, Taraco, the Spring Valley royalty. So effectively, Waterton had a, a buyback option on 1.35% of, uh, of the royalty. That buyback option kept a lot of royalty companies away from Taraco because they didn't know whether they were buying 1.65% or 3%. Two days after the shareholder vote, so literally on the way to the court to finalize the arrangement, Waterton put in a default notice to Taraco and said, I want my money back today. Um, and you know what happened? Wexford put in $12 million and sent them that check that day. So. Other royalty companies were rightfully scared uh, about what Waterton's intent were, and the fact that Sailfish and the financial backing of Wexford were really the only small-scale royalty company that could have pulled off this acquisition, knowing full on well that Waterton can be a piece of work to deal with. Yeah? What is the political situation like in Brazil towards uh, mining? So the, so, so the company does have uh, their installation license not only for the um, uh, for the mine itself, but also the, uh, the, the tailings, which is really kind of, uh, Brazil has been a, a mess with respect to, to tailings in the iron ore sector. Uh, so there's a lot of sensitivity around that. Um, the, for an asset this big, in terms of how they were going to be developing their, um, uh, their tailings management facility, very, very different than, than the, uh, the Valley upstream stuff that, that, was, uh, that failed a couple times in the last, uh, last six years. Uh, so they are permitted. Uh, I think it's a, a reasonable criticism that if I was a, 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 a local guy in Brazil living near a mine, I would have some serious question marks. Um, but they went through the rigor, rigorous process of getting uh, the asset permitted. And now what we're really waiting for is the updated economics on the project itself uh, to make sure that El Dorado uh, can either finance it on its own or find a, a new partner uh, looking at it in a new way in a very new gold price environment. Just a follow-up question, which we open to looking at Additional royalties in Brazil as well, or? It depends on the, on the asset itself. So the, when we look at the, at, at, at the operating side of the business, th there are jurisdictions that we know and jurisdictions that we don't know, right? So we're actually very selective on when we're actually developing a mine. For, for royalty interest, we, there's actually a lot of very good people in, in this industry. So they're, they're good operators in good jurisdictions, even if we, we might not be the world's expert on, let's say, Brazil for, for, uh, as an example. El Dorado is a, is a perfectly competent operator, so we have no issues collecting checks from competent operators, even in jurisdictions that we wouldn't be comfortable in going in ourselves up as, a, as an operating guy. Thank you. Folks, I got a bit excited when uh, I knew Akiba was going to talk about Mako and the San Albino, and I've inadvertently handed out the Mako presentations. Please leave them um, on the table when, um, if you're moving around here, I'm going to collect those, and, because that, the Mako presentation is here at 4 p.m., correct? Sure. Thank you very much. Very great. great. Thank you.